Welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Today we got some more actual history for you from this book right here, Tall Men with Long Rifles, The Glamorous Story of the Texas Revolution, as told by Captain Creed Taylor, who fought in that heroic struggle from Gonzales to San Jacinto, by James T. DeShields. Now, James T. DeShields, if you've been following this channel, he wrote a lot of the stories in Indian Depredations in Texas, and he wrote the book Border Wars. So in 1935, he compiled this book, which was written first by Captain Creed Taylor. So today we're going to read Chapter 1, which is about a situation that William B. Travis found himself in when he was in trouble with the Mexican authorities back in 1831. Texas is the only state of the American Union that was once a free republic, and she maintained that proud position for a period of ten years, voluntarily surrendering her sovereignty for a place in the galaxy of the greatest republic on earth. The Texas Revolution was one of the most heroic wars in all history, a struggle carried on to final triumph against a powerful nation of 8 million souls by a pioneer community of less than 30,000 people and with a mere handful of buckskin-clad, rifle-armed frontiersmen without treasure or training and under the most adverse conditions. As a soaring orator once exclaimed, the Republic of Texas was capitalized with less men and money but with more patriotism and gallantry than any nation on earth. At one time, it was current report that a man named Sam Houston, a big white chief of the Indians, was getting up a great force of painted warriors to invade Texas and take the country away from Mexico. That was the first I ever heard of Houston, and I was told he was a big captain. Many of the settlers knew this remarkable man and were anxious that he should come and help them in their struggle for liberty. The first time I ever saw General Houston was at our army camp on the Cibolo River in October of 1835, after the war had opened, and I admit, I had expected to see a man actually in the regalia of an Indian war chief. He was, however, a picturesque enough figure, and I can never forget the incident of that occasion. Texas was then the El Dorado of America, and many bold and worthy young fellows were constantly coming into the new land of promise. And right here I want to resent the erroneous idea that long prevailed to the effect that the early Texans were a tough and lawless bunch. That early population was composed of the best and bravest pioneers of the period. There were, of course, some lawless and desperate characters among them, especially about the old Mexican settlements of Nacogdoches in the Redlands along the Louisiana-Texas border, and about San Antonio. But the greater bulk of the colonists, especially those of Austin's colony, were a peaceful, industrious, and worthy people. They belonged to the type of men who won the battles of civilization over and against the Indians of the Middle West in Kentucky, Tennessee, Louisiana, expanding the limits of the Great Republic from the Alleghenies to the Mississippi River, and thence, by their intrepid daring, amid difficulties and dangers without precedent or parallel, to the golden valleys of California and the blue waters of the Pacific Ocean. Whatever of vice or crime may have stained some individual careers were the sins of vital impulses and primal passions. There were no degenerates among them, for by inheritance and association, they were the sons of the frontier, of whom it has been truly said, the cowards never started and the weaklings died on the way. Among those who came to the new land of opportunity during the colonial period was a most gallant and worthy young fellow, no less a personage than William Barrett Travis, destined to play a most colorful and important part in the tumultuous affairs of Texas and to win immortal fame. Bill Travis, as he was called by his friends, was a flaxen-haired, blue-eyed, chivalrous-looking young man of fine physique, dignified-looking, standing six feet tall and weighing 175 pounds. Under ordinary conditions, he was mild-mannered enough, but when stirred up, his fighting eye arose and reached a high pitch. He was a bold, frank, and courageous man. 
engaging and attractive in his manners, but perfectly fearless and outspoken, which trait he did not fail to exhibit in his comments upon the high-handed and arbitrary course of the Mexican military authorities sent into the province to overawe and rule the liberty-loving American colonists. Most of the troops sent into Texas were presidarios, a term applied to all convict soldiers. Hence, the garrisons in the provinces were composed of convicts, the vilest class of criminals the Retero slums of Mexico could produce. These murderous thieves and ex-highwaymen were foisted upon the American settlers of Texas to overawe and to hold them in subjection to the tyranny of Comandante Bustamente. And here I shall relate an incident of minor importance within itself, but which came near resulting in an actual clash of arms, and which helped to kindle the fires of revolt that finally flared up into flame and produced the actual revolution some four or five years later. Some of our historians briefly mention this affair, but none of them give any particulars. It was a matter of much gossip among the settlers at the time, and the story makes for interesting reading. Quite a number of Americans had settled in and around Anahawk, and one afternoon in 1831, while four presidarios of the garrison were prowling around, they entered the house of a settler, and finding the husband away and the wife alone, attempted a heinous but nameless crime, the brave woman beating off her assailants until timely help chanced to come. The woman fought with the fury of a demon, and her loud screams attracted the attention of a small party that was hunting in the vicinity, who rushed to the scene. When they reached the house, they found the door securely fastened on the inside, and a terrible struggle going on within. Without a moment's hesitation, they seized heavy timbers, broke open the door, and then rushed in upon the demons. Three of the miscreants fled and escaped. The fourth, who according to the lady's testimony was the ringleader, was knocked down and securely bound. As news of the affair spread, a posse gathered at the scene. All were highly wrought, and some of them wanted to hang the wretch to the nearest limb. One or two suggested that the fiend's head be cut off and hoisted on a pole in view of the fort. But wiser counsel prevailed. The prisoner was a soldier of the Republic of Mexico, and such a course would be an insult to the flag. The Mexican authorities would use it as a pretext to inflict greater tyranny against the colonists. But the colonists felt they must inflict such punishment as would serve as a warning to his thieving cutthroat comrades. A bucket of tar was procured, and a heavy coating was applied to the culprit from head to foot. Then, with her own hand still bleeding from the effects of her terrible fight, the lady ripped open her feather bed, and the trembling wretch was given an ornate dressing of feathers. He was then mounted astride a rail, and in this garb and manner was carried through the settlement and village, and finally turned loose near the fort with a message for Bradburn, to the effect that should such another outrage be committed or attempted by his convict gang, the Texans would rise to a man, and that not even a palado would be left to black the commander's boots. Among those concerned in this imbroglio was the fearless young patriot Bill Travis, and with him chanced to be such other patriotic and daring fellows as Patrick C. Jack, Sam T. Allen, and Monroe Edwards. That was before Edwards had developed into a notorious celebrated forger. When Bradburn learned of this affair, he flew into a towering rage and swore that everyone concerned in the matter would be arrested for insulting the flag by outraging a soldier of the government and sent in chains to Veracruz for trial before a military court. The arrest of Travis and his comrades was the spark that set off the flame. The news flew over the country like wildfire and created the highest indignation. Mass meetings were held in various communities. One assembled at Brazoria on December 16, 1831, and presided over by the fiery patriot Branch T. Archer, was of a very bold and revolutionary nature. Needless to say, the prisoners were soon set at liberty, but the spirit of revolt began to flare up everywhere, and was soon at white heat. History tells all about the stirring scenes and thrilling events that followed till the final clash came. But no matter all this, all I knew or cared for was that a big fuss was on hand and that men were needed to fight. And so with an older brother, Josiah, 
and several other young fellows of our neighborhood, all armed to the teeth, I rode away to war. So that was in 1835 when Creed Taylor, I guess, heard about this story about William B. Travis being arrested, and that was part of the motivation for him and others to come to Texas and assist in the Texas Revolution. So if you want to hear more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Onworthy History.